And what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about how to raise money using equity crowdfunding, which starts in about 45 days. It's more important for people like us that are not under 30 years old. Don't you agree it's a little bit harder for us? <laughs> <laughs> equity crowdfunding is uh, really uh, based on a new law called the Jobs Act. And uh, when I was in 2008, I was raising money for my second fund, real estate fund, and I was sitting at a coffee shop in Palo Alto with a couple other guys. They had a couple of drinks, and I said, hey guys, you know, I did quite well in my first real estate fund, now it's 2008, properties are gonna go up, I need a little financial support. And one of the guys said, you know, it's funny, why don't you just create a website and then like say you're raising money? I said, hey, I can't do that, it's illegal. The other guy says, why don't we create a new law? And then they, they started chit-chatting among each other. They said, you know what? Hey, that would be pretty cool. And the guy's like, yeah, I'll put about $5 million into that. That would be fun. It was unreal what I was hearing. They're like, yeah, let's go to Washington. Let's lobby to create a new law. And this is 2008, ladies and gentlemen. So I said, cool. You're not really interested in backing my fun. Thanks so much. <laughs> Here's my card. <laughs> Keep in touch with me. And it's funny, the thing is, a couple of weeks later, I started getting emails. There's a little inner circle group talking about putting money together to start lobbying. And the whole goal was, hey, let's figure out a way to, to get platforms so we help companies raise money. But how are we going to do it? Then I learned something very important that I think you guys should think about when you're pitching an investor. It's everyone's favorite radio station. W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? It's everyone's favorite radio station because the moment you talk about what's in it for them or you, you care. Talks about what's in it for me, you could care less. Don't you agree? Say yes. Yes. All right. So they said, well, you know what? Let's figure out a creative name for this. this the politicians are thinking about how to get more taxpayers or how to put people to work. At one time, they were laying people off. Banks weren't loaning. So they said, let's call it the Jobs Act where we can help more people get jobs. And we know if we help the young entrepreneurs or the older entrepreneurs to get access to capital, more jobs can be created. Don't you guys agree if you had up to a million dollars, you'd probably raise, you'd probably hire a few people, right? Sure. But I was excited that this thing finally happened in 2012. Boy, oh boy, the Jobs Act is here. Everyone's going to raise up to a million dollars. Anyone had that feeling? It was kind of like Santa Claus, you know, I was waiting for him to come give me that great gift that never showed up. All of 2012, nothing happened. 2013, guess what? Nothing happened. 2014, I know it's got to be the year. It's got to be the year. Nothing happened. In October 30th of 2015, surprise, surprise, Title III of the Jobs Act was approved. Day before uh, Halloween. And... But it says, it wasn't just for, you know, you can't just <clears throat> start on Halloween raising money. You have to wait until mid-May, where these things called funding portals or broker-dealers can allow the companies to raise money. That means you cannot just say, I have a startup, everyday people now, I need your money. You can't do that. It's against the law. You have to use, again, a broker-dealer, which is like a stockbroker, or a funding portal, which is a new term of, uh, these platforms that have to get approved through FINRA and the SEC. Dream Funded is one of those platforms that expect to get approved by probably the end of May, based on the timing. So you still have to be approved by the platform before you raise money. There's a couple of things you need before you get started on these platforms, though. You need what you call the Private Placement Memorandum, which is essentially a legal business plan put together by guess who? I need interaction here. Yes. A lawyer. A lawyer, yes, I know it's simple. We're trying to get you guys warmed up here. Put together by a lawyer. And then a, you need an accountant to review your financial plans. Those two documents are critically important before you put them on a platform because you're going to allow everyday people to review it. There's a downfall that people can see your potential sales or potential business plan, but trust me, I've been an investor in over 30 companies. No one steals ideas. No one cares. No one has your passion. All right, no one wants that ups and downs. So don't worry about people stealing your ideas. Is that fair? So now, now you have these different platforms. So say, for example, you've got the attorney to approve what you're doing. You have the financial statement. And you're going to raise, try to raise money now from everyday people nationwide. So when you're on these platforms now, you think that these platforms are just going to raise the money for you automatically and you're going to sit back and do nothing? 
What do you think? <laughs> There's two types. Two types of platforms. Number one is uh, one that will raise it all for you. Those are really rare. They're more like venture companies. They will, that would be considered investor-led platforms. Well, they will be the one that picks you up. Another one is entrepreneur-led. So you can say join an angel's list. How many people have a profile on an angel's list? I'm not an investor in a company. I like that company. Those that are not on there should think about doing it. I'll tell you why later. So then, so there's two parts of the platform. Part one is that they'll raise money for you, but the second part, it really comes from you, your network. Now when I say that to people, they say, wait a minute, I don't have any network of money. If I did, I wouldn't be using crowdfunding. Anyone thinking that way? Okay, me too. So the beauty of equity crowdfunding is it allows you to raise money from your social network. Anyone here have a Facebook account? LinkedIn account, Twitter account, get started. Good. So the most important thing, I would call it a breeder tool, which is an email. Emails will help you get more people on LinkedIn, get more people on Facebook, maybe Twitter. You want to create what you call your own broadcasting system. Whatever your passion is, you want to let people know what you're doing because you want to drive them to whatever chosen platform that you're going to use. Does that make sense? But you don't want to get started when you raise the money. When do you think you want to get started? Yesterday. Yesterday. You want to have your base now. People ask me, why are you spending so much time with your Twitter account? <coughs> Once you get to work. You know, you have 147,000 followers on Twitter. Isn't that too much? No, it's never enough. Why do you think that is? It's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Who's the salesman back there that said that? <laughs> Good, that's right, it's a numbers game. So people say, well, I don't have that many email addresses. I said, oh, let's get creative. <clears throat> How many people here graduated from a college? Wow, look at that. There's, is there a alum database that has emails in there? Then you can invite them to connect with you because you're just catching up on old times. That makes sense? <clears throat> so um, there's once was a, uh, a, a startup out of Colorado. And this startup really wasn't connected to any investors. Because Colorado, at the, at the time, was really, really a popular place. But he had a vision of what he was going to do, and he kind of wrote out what's in it for the other person through a script, because he was going to create a specific video. And then he had this video, but he had to get it out to other people. So he started working on things, then grabbing all his email addresses, creating a newsletter, making sure they're opt-in so they know it's coming. You start the relationship now. Uh, Seth <coughs> called, what was it called? You mentioned Seth Gold, was, what's, what's his name, Seth? Uh, Seth Godin. Godin. He talks about permission marketing. You want to figure out how to get the permission of the person before you're going to start marketing to them. You don't want to spam people. Does that make sense? We don't want to be, I'm not here trying to create a bunch of spammers. I'm trying to create a bunch of professional fundraisers. Huh? What's the difference? What's the difference? What do you guys think, let's, let's think <coughs> about this. What's the difference between a spammer and an opt-in email? The relationship. Well, the spammy, 90% of all spammy, you will not get any traction or any conversion because they hate your guts. Okay. <laughs> However, if you do it right, they don't know they're being spammed, but if you get them to opt in, then all of a sudden now they're part of your ecosystem and they volunteer. Yeah. Part of your Someone said a good word, started with the word R, relationship. Why did you say relationship, Paul? Because if you don't have a relationship, then it's spam. Right. Correct, that's what it is. So what you want to do is figure out, here's the magic. Figure out how to get them to want to pay attention to you that's before you sell them something. Advantage to your LinkedIn, basically, philosophy, and that they're already actually opt in. They're already Correct. connected with you. Yes. So you have the right to email them. And yes. It's not, it's actually viewed differently than what's in your email. In yes. Your so what Scott set up here was brilliant. That's was why I was talking about the method of connecting them to LinkedIn. Because then you have a relationship with them. You want to start with whatever relationship you may have. They may be part of your social group, maybe part of your church, maybe part of your, your college, whatever. Maybe it's the investor you met here today. Anyone uh, have a Twitter account? How many people actually have it on their phone? I want you to take out your phone. I want you to follow Manny Fernandez because the reason I want you to know <laughs> I did it out of steps. Notice that. Notice that. I did it out of steps. 
that's what a lot of startups push people. You don't want to push them. You want to say, you know what? I want to create a relationship with all of you to keep giving you good advice as well as give you the magical PowerPoint I gave him to many startups that raised hundreds of millions, well, close to a million, hundred million dollars. So you follow me on Twitter, I'll follow you back, and we can direct message each other. This is a lot of confidence to sit there and tell you guys to follow me because I can get the rejection, I know that. I see President Obama do it, and he was able to raise a lot of money for you know, a lot of small donors. That is essentially what crowdfunding is. Right, so you got, you got to put them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, okay, I'm done with that. Now on the paid side, you talked about in-mails, which is important. How did you hear about in-mails? He says he uses them all the time. Whoa, that's a hundred dollars for ten emails. So what most people don't know, angels invest their own money. Venture firms invest other people's money. The smaller non-name venture firms tend to invest other angels' money, and the bigger ones are investing, say, university endowments, pension funds. But at the end of the day, it's still people. Don't you agree? <clears throat> so as a VC through Dream Funded, we're essentially doing the same thing you guys are doing. We are raising money from others. And we use in-mails a lot. In fact, I don't want to see that expensive bill that we pay for that, because it's really hot. But I tell you, the results are amazing, because it doesn't like block it like how spam is. <coughs> Anyone want to know what I write to them, or what we write to them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I talked about someone's favorite radio station. What was that? Good. Always think about that. Don't think about yourself. You know what's in it for you. That's clear, right? We wake up, know what's in it for us. We gotta think about what's in it for them. Now, there's once uh, there's a famous kind of like a hip hop song by a guy named Pitbull. Ever heard of Pitbull? Doesn't matter if you did or not. But it, one part of his song says, "Ask for money, <coughs> get advice." Yes. Ask for advice, get money twice. I think he was a professional fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he used that in his career to kind of. <laughs> raise money for CDs. But the, reason, the reality behind it is, I think about what's in it for the other person, so I kind of write uh, something like, I'd like to get your advice on what I'm doing. So therefore, they're not saying I'm, you're raising money. It's, they're going to look at it a little bit differently. Does it work all the time? No, nothing does. That's a great guarantee what I'm going to tell you. Not everything will work, and everyone have different results. But I can't tell you this whole thing's been a waste of time. You know why? Because if no one takes action on it, it will never work. All right. So the emails are an important thing. Second thing I use a lot is a thing called Schedule Once. Schedule Once is a system that has a link. So our like if you someone wanted to meet with me, they can uh, go to uh, meetme.so forward slash dream funded, and then you can sit there and pick a time. If I accept it, we can have a meeting over go to meeting. Therefore, I don't you don't have to run the meet me in, in person. We can do it over the internet, and I can reach out to anyone in the world through that system. I love that system. It works out quite well for me, and we raise lots of money based on that system. And what I say is, if you send an email to someone talking about you want to get some advice or working on whatever X, Y, Z widget, you want to take a few minutes of their time, and maybe have a link on that Schedule Once link where they can, if they like it, they can decide to talk with you. Does that make sense? And you just got to do it in ratios. It just doesn't mean it works every single time. So before I go to the next part of it, what myths or questions you may have, because I remember the last question you asked her about equity crowdfunding, and she said, well, I'll get back to you. Are you going to have time to go into the mechanics of it? Because one thing I don't understand is if I get investors, you know, how does this work? Do they get stocks? Is this like lending club? For investors, you know, how, how do they get good point? What's in it for them? How do they get what? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good point. That's another that communication spread. Right? Okay. 5,000 people calling you on a weekly basis. Yeah, no problem. So, one question at a time. This question was How does a mechanics work? Very good question. Thanks for paying attention. Well, unlike a fund where, say, we have a fund and we have 99 investors, you're right, you want check. Equity crowdfunding does not work like that. All non-accredited investors cannot invest in a fund. So what happens is these platforms will raise money, and then they'll provide the information to a transfer agent. Then a transfer agent will, will provide the information to you, and, and it's you are, can put them in a convertible note, but you have to manage all investors. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. So now let's go to his question. His question was, and I always try to tend to at, repeat the question so everyone hears about it. Does that make sense? His question is like, what if you have 5,000 investors? What will happen? Well, the answer is no one has more than 2,000 investors. That's the law. At one time, uh, companies can only have up to 500 investors, but with the Jobs Act, they changed it to 2,000, and that is the reason why there's so many unicorns now. 
because companies are just raising money without having to go public. Before, the average time to go public was four years because they hit 501 investors, they, got, they have to go public. Public was essentially a fund-raising event. It wasn't an event for investors to make money, it was for them to raise money, still today. And the, uh, now they could just raise from bigger and bigger funds, so they take a lot longer to go public. The average time of IPO is four years, now it's 11. That's what I talked about earlier, liquidity was critically important in crowdfunding because people are gonna invest in your companies. Most fail, unfortunately. The average time of IPO is 11 years, so you have to wait for an acquisition. It's gonna be an interesting time. So that's what DreamFunding is about. We're gonna provide liquidity through our marketplace. But there's another question here, sir, go ahead. You all actually been through this process. Which part? You have, how, yeah, where? So, so I've raised in New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, I've raised, we raised 711 grand. 711 grand? High five for you, good for you. Yeah. Can you so, stand up and tell everyone, because that, you're my motivation. Yeah. I like, we don't know each other, right? <laughs> Is it okay if you tell us? Yeah, 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 tell me your story. Please tell what happened. Yeah, so we had, we raised 711,000 bucks through crowdfunding. And we found it quite good because it gave us a lot of exposure in the media. Like, and that was probably the reason why we found it easy to attract yeah. investors. I mean, we had to do all the work. Yeah. But, you know, we, we put the word out, got written up all the newspapers and that kind of thing. And one example of a sort of snowball effect of that is uh, one investor put a thousand bucks in, and then just recently they told a mate of theirs um, about it. So I got on a phone call, and in four minutes I got 50 grand off the guy. And then he's um, pledged another 500 grand <coughs> to our seat bridge round. Turns out he's a VC. So he just threw 50 grand off the back of this recommendation from a friend. So it, it works really well for us. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Give him a round of applause, man. Yeah, go ahead. I can understand his frustration. I mean, just, just yesterday I was on a phone call with venture capitalists in Latin America. Venture capitalists nowadays, I think, are way more conservative, even, you know, than a few years ago because of the, you know, what's yeah. going on. So he wants a prototype. He wants, he really wants a lot of proof yeah, of the concept course. before he... Okay. Well, he, he talked about talking to a VC in Latin America and the Latin American VC wanted a prototype. So it's triggered another part of my brain here to say that this is the chain that entrepreneurs should follow when they're raising money. Number one is the three F's. Family, friends, what do you think the third one is? <laughs> <laughs> get a charge extra for that company. It's right, family, friends, and fools. Hold on. And then, you're really a fool. Is the reason they say that is really because they're emotionally they like you, and that's why they're investing. And most investors do it because they like the person. They can tell you it's all about the facts and the numbers. And the, I'm an investor. Our angel group has 32 members. <coughs> One of our investors is an early investor in Google and PayPal. We invested over $16 million. I can't tell you. No, $17 million. It's not all financials. It's the emotion behind the person. It's the passion behind what they're doing. Not so much you're making lots of money. Second part is, well, what if you're not fortunate? You don't really have family, friends, and fools. Then what happens to you? Well, that's what crowdfunding is about. Crowdfunding. You know, well, how do you do crowdfunding to actually get real money, people say? Well, there's a company out of Colorado, I was gonna say the story. He created the video, he promoted it to a social network, he raised um, over $250,000, but what was amazing about what, what happened to him is a, a venture firm called Draper Next is led by Tim Draper. They reached out to him and wanted to invest, and then they reached out to us at Dream Funded and they raised over $2 million. That company was called Notion, an Internet of Things company. And so the, the exposure that they received on Kickstarter led them in Colorado to get attention from uh, Silicon Valley VC firm. Remember, when you're doing it, you're not thinking about yourself. You do that naturally. You gotta look at what's in it for the other person while you craft that video, while you craft that message. Show them how they're gonna make money. Don't hide that. Don't let that, oh, by the way, just give me the money and someday you're magically gonna get the money back. Be direct about it, what you think. It's all a guess, does that make sense? You could draw a timeline from the time that a light bulb goes up in your head to yes. the you have an IPO or get acquired. Yeah. At what point do you see the crowd run, uh, you know, crowdfunding is a good time? And actually, my second part is that yeah. the traditional model of like a, you know, like the angel funding and Series A, Series uh -huh. B, and are you thinking of crowdfunding as a replacement of that or augmentation of that? Good, good question. 
His question was, you know, from idea to IPO, what's the timeline and when do you use maybe crowdfunding? Is that essentially what you're asking? Yeah. Well, if you don't have family, friends, and fool, run to the crowdfunding part, right? So, but if you have, uh, and if you don't have access to angels, you know, I've seen some startups that we funded use the platform and reached out to me and showed me their idea instead of a deck. They showed me what they're doing. They showed me how much traction they have and it makes it quicker for me to make a decision. Um, in some cases, some people game the system. Uh, you know, in the first 24 hours, if you go surpass your goal, the, this thing called, uh, uh, I think it's Indiegogo, excuse me, it's a go-go factor, will uh, make the site more popular. I mean, what you're doing more popular. So some people say, I want a goal of five million, so I'm gonna put the goal of five million, I'm gonna raise nothing. So what you do is put the goal small, five million dollars. <coughs> Maybe have, you want to call your friends, your family members in advance before you launch the campaign. And most people are going to say, I'm sorry, I can't, I love you, man, but I can't help you. <laughs> Ever get that before? I love you, but I can't help you. So you say, you know what, that's fine, I don't want your money, I just want your support. Do you like what I'm doing, you want to support me? Get them to say yes. I say, great, can you share my campaign once I launch it? Can you forward my emails? Because it doesn't cost anything, right? And you get those people lined up. And then you get the people that are going to back you. Maybe it's your brother-in-law has a credit card. The moment it goes live, have them invest. They'll put the money in. They'll get it back in 30 days. Less that fee. But you can greatly show a spike. No, hey, we're entrepreneurs here. We're mar that's one part of marketing. And so um, and then after family, friends, and fools, and after crowdfunding, then you go after a third-party person, which is an angel investor. You can find them on this great site that I like called Angels List. And then people say, well, okay, I, I can find them, but they don't have their email addresses up there. How do I find them? Yes. What do you think? How we can find people that are on angels list? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So, and then um, each of these steps will produce the traction that you need, will produce the prototype that you have. And then you can go to the venture capitalist and say, look at my prototype, look at my traction. You never want to start there because people at that level are looking at different things. They're looking at massive traction, they're looking at age, a lot of different things. So you want to work your stuff up before you go to a micro VC or a VC firm. Any other questions? Because so I heard I only had a few minutes So you're you talking about actually creating a hybrid model, right? Where you are doing the crowdfunding at some point and then also going to the VC at, at another point. That will work, right? That, it doesn't have to be one or the other. <coughs> we have a lot of relationships with Series A, Series B, Series C investment firms that if we see something good, they want us to refer to them. <coughs> so some of these platforms are acting like one type of a VC firm, if you will, with a very large network. So I think that if you want to have more control over your destiny, look very seriously at equity crowdfunding. We can get the capital and build up your prototype before, instead of taking so long shopping it with the, with the venture firm, and you know, the, the odds are pretty <coughs> slim. Okay, yes sir. How do you manage your cap table? How do you manage the cap table? That's a great question. That's you as the entrepreneur to manage the cap table. You can have only up to 2,000 investors. When a funding portal raises the money and gives the investors to you through a transfer agent, it's for you to handle it with your, your attorney. <clears throat> so that's for you to handle it. And that is the end of my talk. Thank All you so right, very guys, much. Thank you.